the reality television format solidified with MTV's The Real World back in 1994, um, but reality television didn't really explode into prime time in the US until uh, uh, 2000. 13 years later, the genre has um, now hit its teens, um, and it doesn't seem to be anywhere near slowing down. With no shortage of housewives, hillbillies, and rock stars on television, can we call this the period of the terrible teens of reality television? Troy, what do you think? Is this the terrible teens? Uh, I think as long as people are still watching it, it hasn't gotten to be terrible just yet. <laughs> uh, there, there, are a few, there are a few shows that are built around uh, celebrities that I question whether or not they can hold an audience. So we're getting to that point where we, we might have to explore a few other avenues. Yeah, correct. Um, do you feel, though, that like, uh, it's sort of come into its own now? I mean, has it really sort of solidified in, in the styles of reality television? Well, it has. I think it's one of those things where you know, celebrity reality is kind of the, the real surprise over the last 10 years. I don't think that anybody was expecting it to become quite as pervasive uh, as it has. Reality TV used to sort of manufacture its own celebrities. Mm -hmm. you know, nobody knew who Puck was before the real world, and, and now, you know, now we know who a lot of different people that have cycled through those shows are. But as far as uh, shows where you're bringing celebrities on board specifically to boost the show from the beginning, <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, I got to turn this down. Then. Uh, but, but the train just derailed. So let's. Let, <laughs> we'll skip let's ahead to the next. The, we just got really real. Just there. yeah, we did. We did. Well, you were yes. saying that a lot of the shows. Why are my keys in the refrigerator? <laughs> Well, you were actually saying that a lot of the shows started off sort of creating their own, manufacturing their own celebrity. Do you feel that that's still really prevalent, or is it more that we're kind of hooking in with the, the celebrities and the sort of well-known people? Well, I'll tell you, there's been, a, there's been a, a, a big thing now in occupational-themed shows, and you have a lot of things like Duck Dynasty that are coming up, and you're, you're getting really, you know, I can't say enough nice things about Duck Dynasty. I don't know why I like it so much. I've heard it's really popular. You guys watch it? But, yeah, but we are sort of we are sort of coming back around to the point where we're making our we're manufacturing our own celebrities again, and I think it's because we've the spatula has struck the bottom of the barrel, and pretty much everybody who was ever a third stringer on Saved by the Bell has been on a show by now, so we're 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 kind of done. It seems like a really good way to revive a fit, you know a career that's just really gone into the toilet. <laughs> so wonderful. Um, Jen, could you explain to people, if people aren't really familiar with the development process, sort of how it works for, um, when someone has, like you have an idea for a show, how does it sort of, how do you take that idea and kind of get it to... To, to production? Well, yeah. it, that's changed a lot, I would say, over the last few years. Um, right now, the trend is to have your cast first. Um, if you have an idea, I, good luck, um, because basically the networks are now seeing that what everybody wants to see are the characters. Um, that's what's gonna keep them turning on the television. So basically, for us, they really, you can have an idea all day long. That's not what they feel is going to sell it. What's gonna sell it is the cast. So for us, we've noticed a trend where the networks, um, almost across the board, I don't know if you've experienced this, but they want the cast first. Yep. So you can have an idea, and the thing they're gonna tell you is, that looks fabulous, cast it, and come back and see us. Mm -hmm. And I think the only exception to that, I think, is if you're doing a reality competition or game where the mm -hmm. format is really the star. Mm -hmm. And even then, they like to have a host attached or like to know exactly you know, what, what, what's the attraction for that particular show. Right, and I think in, in that instance, too, you have to have a really good track record in that format, and you have to, you have to already be established, basically, if you want to do competition reality shows or any, you know, a lot of times I'll have people that'll tell us I have a great idea, um, and that's really just not enough anymore. You know, like Troy said, you really have to have something attached and something that the network can grab onto. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Well, that, that actually brings up another question because the company that you started um, really sort of fulfills a recent niche in the market um, because it allows the networks, what happens is with her company is that a network doesn't need to go to a production company anymore or, or have a production company come to them and pitch them a story. What they do is they take their ideas and they go to a casting and developing company and they pay them a one-time fee to cast a show for them that's their internal idea. And what it does is it basically keeps them from being 
um, married to a production company or the pe person that brought them the idea. Um, that allows them to turn around when they have the idea, they have the cast in place, they can then turn around and basically handpick the company that they feel they want to work with and they can make the, a better deal because they're not having to negotiate for the story idea. Um, and it's really kind of uh, brilliant with, with that. And how do you feel that um, that new sort of model for getting content on television, how has that changed the lineup of what we're watching, would you say? You mean as far as like the, who the cast is or, or what type of people? Or, or, or how are you seeing, does that, what does that change do you think is gonna mean for what we're watching on television? Do you think it's gonna really affect the shows that we're watching? Yeah, I mean, I think it opens it up a lot. For instance, when a production company is looking for something, they're thinking of a lot of different things. Everybody is really, somewhat thinking of long term. When you're a production company, you're thinking, how hard is this gonna be to shoot? What's the budget gonna be like to shoot on that? Um, and everybody's thinking of how much money I'm gonna make on it. <laughs> so for us, when you're doing something like that, um, we don't have to think long term as far as for us, we find the cast. Um, and again, they're not even happy so much anymore. It used to be that you could find the people and pitch them and that was great, but now it's almost like you have to develop it out. So we find the people, we make sure that they have the storylines and that as a group, if, if it is that type of show that um, it has longevity, so. So what you're saying is you're actually having to sort of give them the storyline for the whole season. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Not wow. for the whole season. That's when I would say probably what we do is step one, and I would hand that over to Troy at that step. So for now, um, we find the cast, and how we do that is basically, you know, we will go and do almost everything via Skype now. I mean, that way it opens up everywhere for us. So, uh, you know, I don't have to be there. I don't have to spend the money to go out and shoot it, and the networks realize that really you can tell the personality very quickly. And so from then, we make sure that it's something viable, meaning that it has, um, that there are storylines. But we don't have to, you know, for us, it would be season one. So are you saying that you actually don't have to go out and shoot a little sizzle reel or anything? No. Or are you that's, shooting that's, just interviews? Absolutely. Step one it, for us is we have to prove that the cast is there before we even get to the sizzle reel uh, to that step. That's one way to do it. I mean, and again, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. For, for instance, if the production company or network comes to us, that's how we do it. We also find the cast ourselves at times, or we have an idea, and in that instance, I do have to shoot a sizzle reel and pitch it gotcha. to them. Troy, would you talk a little bit about, in case the audience, our audience doesn't know what a sizzle reel is, and can, okay? Well, I'll tell you, a sizzle reel, uh, the first thing I'll do, I mentioned this in the panel yesterday, Dan Abrams uh, did a thing with the PGA. If you do a web search on the, the name Dan Abrams and sizzle reel, you'll come up with a little thing that basically describes six different types of sizzle reels. Um, typically what I do is I'll produce something that's between a minute to three minutes long, just so you get an idea of who the cast is and what the interactions are gonna be like on the show. Um, if it's a reality competition series, I usually don't do a sizzle reel because it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do that. Again, the for if the format is the key to the show, a sizzle reel is not something that's always necessary. Um, there are great examples of sizzle reels online. I would tell you that the sizzle reel for The Muppet Show, as old as it is, is still the best, the, the best sizzle I've ever seen in my life. Um, are you just a big Miss, Miss Piggy fan? Is that why? I, a well, no, it's, it's secret closet it's, Miss it's Piggy It's literally fan. a guy trying to convince the network that they should buy the show. And it's just like a Muppet. Like, if you like Bernie Brillstein and you like so-and-so, then this is that and the other. And the kids are going to like it because of the hippie humor. And this so-and-so is going to like it because of this kind of humor. And it's so smart and unusual and fun that it really, it really kind of engages you. And I think the deal with the sizzle reel is, um, whenever I'm trying to sell a show that has a personality attached to it, um, I'll do just a general follow with them and just kind of try and see you know, a glimpse into their lifestyle so you can understand that there's something wacky or unusual or engaging about them. Um, what you don't want to do in a sizzle reel is, uh, is use it as an opportunity to explain to the network, uh, you know, the sort of mundane stuff like, and by the way, you could sell books based on this right. thing, and you could do that. Uh, it's a mistake that a lot of people make in sizzle reels. It's not about trying to convince the network how much money they can make. It's about trying to convince them that you have a viable idea. And, and I feel like, and Kristen, um, see if you agree with this, but I also feel like with, with sizzle reels, a lot of times newbies try to put the whole, pack the whole story into a three-minute sizzle mm -hmm. reel. And the problem with that is that you can end up telling enough of your story that the, that, that the person watching it feels really 
ha- fulfilled. <laughs> They're like, okay, I've seen it. I've learned what I need to learn from it, and I'm done with it. You know, you want to always leave your audience watching it wanting to have more. If you if you complete an entire arc and you give them the whole story in three minutes. Right, and that again is why you want to keep it to, I mean, most of my sizzle reels are under a minute. Really? Um, because wow. it's just one of those things where it's just like, I just want to show everything to you as fast as I can so that I can start a conversation with you. Yeah. It's, not that I, it's not that I want to give you a, a, the all access pass to everything that we're going to have, it's just I want you to understand what's happening. The longest sizzle reel I ever cut, um, I had talent that was very specific, they say, well, I don't want to cut any more out of it because if they can't watch me for 11 minutes, I don't want to work with them. Well, you can't expect anybody to watch anything for 11 minutes. Not in L.A. Yeah, not, not in L.A. The attention spans are, like, crazy. Um, so, again, just keep them, keep them short and uh, dazzle them. And the idea is always to get a conversation started. It's not necessarily to present them with something that's finished. Did you have anything to add with that, Kristen, about the sizzle reel? I was reel? saying that it needs to be a tease. I think if you think about it that way, mm-hmm. like when you're doing and you see like news stories and they give you that tease, and that's what it should be, more of that type of thing where you want to have more type. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You sort of hint at things, but you don't tell them the whole kit and caboodle. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Um, Troy, in your opinion, how has the pitching process on, you know, as a producer, how has the pitching process to the networks changed in maybe the last five years? Have you seen a shift on, on your side? Well, I'll tell you, you know, usually when I pitch, I have a production company that I'm working with at the time. I don't pitch directly to network very often, although I do have an open door at certain networks to pitch. Um, I would tell you that the, uh, the pitch meetings tend to be very short, but they always have. Uh, they can't wait to get you out the door or keep you for two hours. Uh, they'll decide when you get there. Um, the pitch process really has been the same since I've really started pitching, which I've only been pitching since about 2008. You know, the rest of the time I was trying to build up a career so that people would actually let me in the door. So that's one of the other things I would tell you is that, you know, remember that if you're going out with with an original series or an original idea or original something, um, trying to get in and pitch a series, it's like going to the Army recruiting office and saying, I'll join, but only if you'll make me a general. Mm-hmm. is you just, you really have to understand that like there are people that have been in the business for a very long time that are ahead of you. So in order for you to make something special, you need to form alliances with those people mm-hmm. who can help you get in the door and actually execute that show if you sell it. So what you're trying to do when you're pitching is you're trying to uh, get production companies on board with you at this point if you're new. Mm-hmm. It's not about trying to get in the door at the network. And it's scary too. I mean, I, I did a, a sizzle reel for um, the Food Network and uh, I think Charles Nordlander was at the time the director of development there and he loved the sizzle reel and ca- basically called me up and said, I love this so much, but it's not what we're looking for, but I'm gonna open, you know, have an open door if you wanna come pitch something. And I was like, I don't, I, I'm a producer. I, don't, I can't talk, no, I can't go and talk, so I can't sell. Well, it's a big, and, different and, skill set, really. And you know, too, one of the things that I, one of the best pieces of advice I think you can get as, as a new show creator is if you walk in the door and you say, "Have is this show," and here it is, and here's what the show is about, and the person says, "Oh, but if we did this other element or we did this other thing," um, your answer to that is, "Sure." Mm-hmm. It's not well. That's not the show I came in with. You're not trying to correct them and sell them on this particular vision that you had for the show. If you come in with a cooking show and they decide they want to make it about motorcycles, guess what? If you can get them to buy a show about motorcycles from you that you made up in the room based on your thing, you still sold a show. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a very valid point. I think one thing that I see people do is get too attached and get too emotionally attached. And that's something that I would say is a huge downfall um, because... N- no idea is, you know, is so original that, oh my God, this is the only person in the world who's had this idea. You have to have this idea. I think like Troy said, that is a huge mistake to get emotionally attached and to tell a network or a production company, nope, this is the way it's going to go down. This is what I want. This is exactly what I see. Um, it's just impossible to do that. Mm-hmm. No, I was also going to tell you, there's, there's also a thing called a non-participant producer that if you sell a show and you don't have a tremendous amount of experience and you're working with a production company, be prepared um, to take that created credit and share that with whoever you develop the show with. Your goal long-term in developing a career is to sell as much material as possible. So if you can't get yourself added to a show that you sell as a regular line and participating every week as a producer, there's nothing wrong with that. You're still going to get... I mean, the deals vary, but you can get 2.5% of the, the production company's 25% or whatever it is 
um, and just take your check and cash it every week and just keep creating other things. 90-10. I have no... I'm just telling you, I've, I've, heard, I've heard everything, so I was trying to give you the lousy one as the example. <laughs> well, um, uh, Kristen, what, um, what would you say to people who said, well, I, I don't know about pitching my idea because I don't want them to steal it. What would you say to people who, you know, are worried about losing their idea? Yeah, well, I mean, when you're pitching your idea, obviously it's your own and your original, so it's out there and you kind of, unless they're taking it completely and um, word for word and doing it, I mean, they might take some ideas from you, but I would say that, I mean, it's your idea if they're gonna work with you and they're not gonna try to create controversy um, out there with, I mean, by stealing it completely. Yeah. They, uh, there is no way, there's no way to protect your idea. I, there just isn't, I think that what you do is, anybody that's been in the business in any good production company, what we have is each other. And I think anybody who's been in the business long enough knows that that longevity, that your reputation is the only thing that's gonna sustain you in such a finicky business. And so I think that anybody, most people are not out to steal, flat out steal an idea. Um, however, though, I've had people come in and they're like, I've got it with the WGA and I've got this locked up and how do I know you're not gonna steal it? And my thing to them is you don't. I, you don't, and I don't, you know, so. It's it, been done. Yeah. <laughs> We've all many, been many. there. <laughs> well, and you'll, you'll be shocked as well when you go out with an idea that there are things that I come in with where the meeting starts with the person saying, now I want you to know, we already have something else that we're developing in this space. Your take may be different, we might really in, enjoy it, so we wanted to take the meeting on that, but we want to inform you up front we have something else that's in the same space. Um, and I can also tell you there are gonna be times where you know, there's, a, there's a show that I pitched to a specific producer the two years later they called me uh, to help them develop a show that was the exact same concept as yeah. what I pitched them, yeah. that they wanted to hire me to help them develop it. Um, I didn't think, well, geez, they stole my idea, because they basically they came back and they were like, well, we saw this TV commercial where this happened and blah, 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 and we thought that this would be great. So I stewed for about three days and I thought, well, you know what, they saw a TV commercial, they thought, well, you know, we'll do a show that's similar to that. And it was a very successful show, but it's one of those things where if I had overreacted and gotten litigious and jerky, I probably would not be working 13 years later because people tend to look at the people who are litigious as, you know, hot potato, not do not it. touch, don't take a meeting with this yes. guy. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's really about your, your reputation. And, and, and the truth is, is you can't copyright an idea. It's impossible. And, 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 and the other truth is, is that there's nothing out there that's wholly original. Um, because as much as we, you know, you have an idea and you think, okay, no one's ever had this idea. And then you talk to other people and they're like, oh yeah, that's just like something else that you just haven't ever seen before. And there's a reason why you see kind of similar themed shows on or you'll see similar films because they're not necessarily ste stealing those ideas. Is there something in the zeitgeist it's out there and, and people ha gravitate towards certain themes and then you know the, how they manifest them into a story is what makes them unique and that's really. Right, it's really the execution. When you see shows like Pawn Stars and the millions of Pawn shows that have spun off of that, each one of them has a different take and it's really about the personality of the place that they're at. So it's, you know, a thing might be hot at the particular moment but there will be lots and lots of spin-offs but they'll each have their own real sort of point of view that differs and that's what makes the shows different. So Troy, what would you say, um, why would you say it's so important to know your buyer before even starting to develop your, your show well, concept? Well, here's the thing. When I, when I first started um, creating shows, I created things that were really personal to me. Um, one of the great ones was, I, I talked about this woman in a, in a thing earlier. There's a woman named Allie Willis who is one of the most creative, amazing, gifted songwriter, painter, like all around bagel of interestingness uh, sort of folks. And I really wanted to do a reality show about her and her life. And it was one of those things where I didn't create it with a network in mind. I had no end buyer in mind. I spent, you know, into five figures uh, shooting a sizzle reel, which was insane. Um, but, it's, it, but it looks gorgeous. She's an amazing person. We ended up taking a couple meetings with production companies on it. One of them that she came in on, the rest of them I took by myself. And no one had any idea where to take it because it was not a show that was engineered for a particular network. When you are coming up with a show, I would urge you to think commercially and say, this is the kind of show that Bravo runs. I wanna create a show that I know will appeal to them and be in the same sort of wheelhouse as what they do. Then you're gonna watch Bravo for an evening and you're gonna write down the names of all the production companies that make shows for Bravo and those are the people that you're gonna take that idea to. 
your chances increase exponentially if you are just smart enough to target it so that when you can walk in, you could say, I'm familiar with Real Housewives. Like if, if you were going to Shed, the company that I work for, you could say, well, I know you guys do Real Housewives of New York. I know that Bethany Frankel was a big hit for you. I have a, the, the, another great big personality just like hers that I think would be fantastic for a show. Da, 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 da. And it makes them understand that you are really thinking, again, com you've got your, your commercial viability hat on and that you are smart enough to go to the people who have the relationships with that network already. Um, not to say that there isn't value in creating things that are very personal to you. There are a lot of shows that do make it to the air that are things that people were really passionate about. But what I do is I keep those ideas in something I call the brick. I just have a very large binder that is just, well, here's the show that doesn't have a network. And three years later, when there's a new executive at that network who wants to do all new shows and they want to do more things that take place in this type of environment or whatever, you can say, here's this thing I have fully developed out, and that's when you can approach that network or the production companies that work with them then. It's a great idea. I'd like to see that binder. <laughs> kind of imposing. Yeah. Or if they don't like your ideas, you can just throw the binder at them, right? Yeah, it could be smart and just keep it on a hard drive, but it's much more impressive to, <laughs> poof, yeah, to pull it out it like the... Like, the Necronomicon and the little beams of light shooting out of it as you open it. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to open this one up to whoever would like to answer. Um, but do you guys see a shift away from any sort of uh, any specific type of reality show? You know, we have we have the com we talked a little bit about the competition, the celebrity. There's other other um, uh, formats for reality shows. Do you guys see any shift away or any? You talked a little bit about the um, the work the work show being popular. Is there? I think the biggest one right now is like the redneck craze going on. I mean, you see them everywhere from Honey Boo Boo to um, Buck Wild. Buck Wild, and I think that's kind of the newest trend. I think everyone jumps on board with one trend, and then it was like Jersey, for example. Yeah, we got tired of Guidos, so now we want yeah. rednecks. <laughs> so it's something that people, I think, can laugh at almost, and people who are willing to do it to an extreme. Um, and I think a lot of that even started with the Honey Boo Boo. She was on the Toddlers of Tierra, yes. people had such a fascination with her that people were like, oh, let's do this thing, and then another yeah. show springs up, and because people have an interest, it's like, I don't live that way, and I want to see how these people are real, are they really doing this, and yeah. how long is it really real? I mean, because now Honey Boo Boo is making all this money, is she really still living in that poor environment, or are they just doing it to keep the show going? I, I kind of feel like Redneck Weddings started the, don't we think Redneck Weddings kind of started that trend? Anybody? No? Okay. Yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I kind of felt like we were working with rednecks on Hogan Knows Best, but... Oh. Um, I'll let you go there. <laughs> I can now. You have a job at full time. <laughs> I can dish out the juice. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to be You know what I'm seeing fewer of that was a huge thing for almost a, a decade was prank shows seem to be scaling back a little bit finally. Um, but see, you haven't seen Betty White's new show. Oh, I, oh I've seen Betty, seen White's Betty White's new White's show. That's, 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 Do you guys that's like why that? I, that's why I'm thinking it's over. <laughs> 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 Betty, <laughs> Betty White is going to put a cap on that. It's been going since 1948. It's a, it's about she's time. only got like four more years left. So. Yeah, she's got, <laughs> yeah. And there went her I career. <laughs> Yikes. No pitching to Betty White. I kind of feel when I watch that show that I, I, feel, I just feel bad like I you have to laugh because they're old like you want to support them in their craziness you know you haven't seen it you have to see it watch it it's great <laughs> it's for what I call a CBS crowd <laughs> no it's a it's one of those things too where the one thing I will say that's been great about Betty White is I think that every once in a while people say oh wow I guess I guess you can put someone on television who's over 25 and people will watch it Absolutely. This is the thing with reality television that's actually been the biggest, the biggest problem for me is there had been an obsession in the early years of reality television. And when I say the early years, reality TV's been around since 1948, but as we know it, since like 2000. It used to be everybody was 25 years old, everybody was 25 years old. Now there's people in their late 30s and their 40s, and there's the old guy on Survivor who's going to be 60. And, you know, we're, we're starting to see a little bit more variety in, in the landscape there. I don't know if we're still going to be able to, I don't know if we're going to be able to sell a reality show about someone who's not famous, who's over the age of 40. I wonder about... But, but the, the, the field is broadening a little bit. Is being generous, I 
I think. Yes. I remember the real world castings were like, if you're 18 to 24, if not, you're too old. Yeah. <laughs> well, wasn't, I mean, she was kind of a, a trendsetter when she did Golden Girls, and they were like, oh, we've right. got a show for old people. And that was like, what? That was like 30 years ago or something. So she just keeps coming back and making shows. And they always think they're geniuses when they put on a show with old people. Like, look what we did. <laughs> I got news for you. There's a lot of old people out there. You can make more. You just, you know, Betty is not the only <laughs> old person. the only flavor available at 31 Flavors. There's, there's 30 other, 30 other very nice old actors that should be working. I think, though, that to speak to those trends, um, in reality television, I think one thing that's been proven again and again and again is that it will never truly go away. Nothing will. It's just a matter of time. Um, so if you have this fantastic idea, which a lot of us you know, know to just sit on it um, and wait till it comes back around. So even if the networks say, uh, you know, that's not something that we're interested in now, it's just a matter of time before it comes back. Right. Very cool. Okay. Um, it seems that reality shows often have longer shelf lives than narrative shows. Um, do you guys feel that, um, or what do you guys feel that contributes to the longevity of certain shows over others? I'd say that you can repurpose it and reinvent them and have spinoffs of the different shows. And just look, look at the Housewives, for example. You had one successful um, you know, group in Orange County, and then they do another city so that people can relate to them. And there's just a lot more reinventing and repurposing of it. Um, you get new cast involved. The Bachelor, there's always somebody new. There's always taking mm -hmm. someone from the previous cast, making them the new Bachelor, Bachelorette. And um, it just, it, it makes it so that you can just keep going and going right. and going, and there's always gonna be a new crowd watching it. And you're not stuck to one specific format. I mean, when that's the great thing about cast, or doing a show with real people, is that their lives inevitably change. Um, and people come in and out. So if you see that something uh, needs new life uh, breathed into it, then you can always, you have control of that, or we do, you know, as producers. So, so that, I think, really um, ha helps with the longevity of a show. America's Next Top Model reinvented their show like that. Yep. They had, um, saw like their numbers going down, I guess, and then they start bringing social media into it and bringing fan interaction and um, changed their whole format and got rid of their certain judges. They had Tyra, that was the only thing really the same, and they kind of redid it all. Mm -hmm. so. Do you know what the log line was for the most recent uh, show of uh, Snooki and Wow on their new ser series? Was um, just how old does a baby have to be to go to the club? <laughs> <laughs> But they did find that the numbers, the numbers for that show went down as they started to, you know, get a little older and settle down. They all had boyfriends and girlfriends and, you know. That's it's just boring. Well, too, when you, when you talk about the longevity of a format, I would tell you about the only thing, one, one of the things that we, we don't really necessarily think of a lot, um, a lot of production companies will, will have a show that uh, their arrangement with the network is that the network owns that show or, or has the rights to that show in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and then all of a sudden you can, the production company can resell that show anywhere else in the world um, through companies like Deadmar Mercury and things like that. It's what Tom Beers did with his library uh, for Deadliest Catch and a lot of other things. Um, about the only thing I would tell you that doesn't translate internationally, uh, you can sell formats for reality competition shows, but actual seasons of reality competition shows where something actually starts in the first episode and then wraps up in the 13th episode. Those competition series don't really have much of a shelf life as far as re-airings. Because once you know who, who wins that series, you're not gonna watch it at 10 o'clock at night again. But people can, you can watch something like Dog Eat Dog or, I'm showing my age, I'm using Dog Eat Dog as an example. <laughs> uh, Fear Factor and things like that, stuff that you can strip out five nights a week. Those are great to resell overseas. Mm -hmm. If you can come up with shows that are like that, you know, I'm not they saying they're feel, easier to sell, but they're very attractive to people who, who, who make those types of shows because they know that they can repackage it and format it. I will always watch a show where they eat bugs. I don't care how old it is. I'm, I'm ready for that to come back, actually. I do like that. Um, Jen, it's something interesting that's happening. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for Finally, sharing. Finally, that bug-eating show I've Good been to know. sitting on all these months. Um, but something interesting that we were talking about with the, your company um, and something that, that I think you've been seeing with um, the networks is that um, there's also a, been a trend with the networks seeing their cast as more of a brand. Can you talk a little bit about what, what that trend is? 
Absolutely. I mean, uh, pretty much now, uh, anybody who signs a contract to be on a reality television is basically signing their life away for the next uh, minimum, you're looking at probably three years. Um, and then they basically have it so that um, if I cast five people and the network loves them, they are secure to know that they can invest money in, in those people because they have them. Basically, as long as that show airs and is popular, um, they own every part of that talent. I just had somebody call me, and a lot of times people don't realize that. They called me and said, uh, they're on a show right now that's airing, and they said, but you know what? I want to do another show, and I'm going to do X, Y, and I'm going to do Z. And I'm like, this is the person who signed the contract. And I had to tell them, you're not doing anything. That network, if, if you do anything, uh, the network has their hand in it. For instance, that's really become a new trend as well. Um, if you do anything, let's say, after you are on air, you write a book. The network has their hand in that book. The network will tell you whether you can write that book and how you can market that book. I mean, obviously, they want that to happen, but you're not going to make a move without them. Right. Without them. Well, and the, re the reason that all happened, in case you don't know, the reason for that major shift is uh, Bethany Frankel. Uh, when she sold Skinny, Skinny Girl, Girl for $120 million and Bravo didn't own any piece of it, and had basic they basically felt that they had been giving her endless exposure and publicity and a platform to promote herself, um, everybody kind of became aware in the industry that it's one of those things where, you know, that they're going to they're, they're gonna invest in you, they're going to expect a little something back. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with that, but it's sort of just the tone of the industry right now. Sort of like we're, you know, we're investing in basically free PR for you. But, but, but what's interesting is, if, correct me if I'm wrong, were you not saying that they're doing this for, with people who already have pre-existing businesses and stuff? That is the, that's very, very new. And I, actually, that's been over the last year that a lot of the contracts we're seeing come across have changed. It used to be that if I gave you a platform uh, to be on TV and then you did something Something with that platform, they had a piece of it, and by that I mean a percentage of it. Um, and now they're coming in, and let's say, you know, I have Jennifer Dubasak movie theaters. Um, they are coming in and saying, any increase in your business in that movie theater after the show airs, they want a piece of that as well. And that's, you know, that's that's kind of scary. How would how does it compare for people who are coming in as celebrities, like you know the the Osbournes, the Tokens, is it different for them? If you are an existing celebrity, you have an awful lot more leverage. If I want to do a show about you, then I really need you. I'm not trying to build a show from scratch about you and your business. You know, if I want to do a show right now about Sharon Osbourne, I'm pretty sure that she's going to dictate the terms of what it is I want to do with her. Um, but again, if you're, if, you're, if you're brand new, it's a different situation than if you're a celebrity. Yeah, and um, what about the difference? Because you know, you brought up Honey Boo Boo earlier, and and um, I know that they they disclosed the amount that she was making in the second season as opposed to the first. And we all know that in reality television, you know, you sign those huge contracts and you don't make money usually in the first season. It's only when you come back to the table for a second season. Have you guys seen those numbers jump for for the for those cast members, or are they still static? Or yeah. uh, I, I was going to say I it. Yes. I think in anything that you do in reality TV, you have to know the cards that you hold. Um, coming in first season, you hold no cards. They don't know how you're going to do. You could be a total bomb for them. And you literally would be shocked, I think majority of people are, what the contracts are. Um, basically, people make nothing if they don't come out of their pocket for things. So. Um, when, if you're a huge hit like Jersey Shore, then again, you are by then going to have an agent. You're going to have more people that have approached you and know how to deal with the networks. And the networks, just like any other business person, they're going to weigh out what your demands are and what it means to them. So I think it's, um, yes, those numbers jump if you get a season two. And depending on you know, the network's always going to look at how much money can I make of it. Jersey Shore, they were do branding, they t-shirts, all of this stuff that they can make the money off of. So I think um, that's how you determine how much more you can I have get. Jersey Shore cat dishes. <laughs> I, I have the app that you can take your face and, it, and you can Jersey, Jersey Shore-fy yourself with, you know, glasses and it puts like, you know, it puts like 
stuff and swag in your hands. How do I not know about this? I don't know, man. It's awesome. Does anybody have that app? Anybody? No. Okay. Do you? <laughs> I'd say with money, too, it's, I mean, how long, how popular you are. I was looking at some numbers for the Housewife series, and um, Heather, who came in new, was like $20,000 she was getting for the whole season, where Nene Leakes, who's now a big name, is getting a million dollars for her season. And when she started off, you know, she wasn't getting that money, and she probably wasn't even getting the highest in her cast because she wasn't the star of her cast. But she took her brand and developed it and got on other shows. And now for them to use her, she needs a lot more money. Well, and two, I'm also seeing, uh, as far as a lot of the talent contracts, how they're now written out where your contract is for the first three seasons with built-in predetermined raises if we go to a second or third season. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's just to sort of stem the whole, if you have a big hit, then all of a sudden somebody wants $75,000 an episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we can also talk, I mean, we're talking about profit. Um, you know, in the world of reality television, only a certain amount of unknown is allowed. And by unknown, I mean sort of uncharted or unplotted for the series. Um, how, how do producers ensure that they're going to be able to get that final product to the, for the networks? Um, when, you're d when you're dealing with an, with an unknown, as you far don't. as you mean an, un an unknown, <laughs> well, as far as, I mean, you, are, you, are you referring to talent that's unknown or a, co a concept that's new or? I mean, what happens when you're shooting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, every reality show, it's one of those things where, you know, when I, whenever, I, whenever I pitch, I always have a full treatment ready to go that has, this is a sample 10 episodes. Now, I'm going to tell you that those 10 episodes will never happen as I beat them out. It's just one of those things where it's, you know, I think this person has, has this much going on in their life that I'm pretty sure you could follow this storyline, this storyline, and this storyline. They have these things planned for the next year in their life so that, that, that what's happening mm -hmm. seems feasible. Now what'll happen is you'll start shooting it and they'll have all kinds of crazy new developments or they'll do what I call self-producing where they suddenly decide, I don't want to do any of it because I don't like how this is going. And then you're in real trouble. But, yeah. And then it's all about sort of like not letting on to the network that you, we've got other storylines coming, new things are happening, new stuff is changing. Um, that's, that's a very yeah. different experience from what I went through. I, I, I found tough. that if we said that we were going to develop, because I, when I worked story producer, if we said we were going to do 10 stories, we did those stories. Mm -hmm. If we had to hire actors to come in and play roles of boyfriends, new boyfriend relationships, we did that. Mm -hmm. So... Oh, Lord, you're spilling it all. <laughs> I didn't say how it worked for. Whose side have, are you I on? Have, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have not had that experience on any of the shows that I've been on. Some Yet. of them, they would hire friends, or you put the relationships together, and I, yeah, I've seen that a lot. Or we, well, let's, this happen, but okay, let's redo that situation and redo it from this angle now and do get all the different things, so they are re Well, what you, what you can do also is when, when, those, when those stories come together is they have a, a, usually a meeting once a week or so, and they come up with the story beats for the week. We're going to go here. This is going to happen. We're going to go here. This is going to happen. We're going to go here. This is going to happen. And you just sort of gently steer things along in a way that you think that's going to cause people to bump into each other and is going to give you conflict that's going to be good for air. Um, for example, like I would, t I would say, if you and I were, were going out to lunch, I would say, by the way, we need to have a conversation about Jennifer when we go to lunch. You know, and all the stuff she said last Thursday, and then eventually we'll hopefully get into a fight about what she said. Yeah, and um, I but that's about as far as the manipulation really goes on most reality shows that I've worked on. Okay. <laughs> We're both I haven't, like, I, haven't, like. I haven't gotten into the really, the really good down and dirty, skeezy, cheesy stuff, but I know that it, I know that it does happen. I think too, though, you, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about entertaining. And, and I think, as you know, like, you, you never know what you're going to get. Some things just don't play. You can, you can put it on paper all day long and um, what you think is going to be said and how you think they're going to say it just doesn't happen. And it's not entertaining. So I think that's when you have to fight for the fact that, you know, you're the creative on it. And so you just have to fight and say that wasn't the most interesting angle of it. So and it's and, not always happy with it. But And in the defense of the executive producers, usually if you come to them and you've got a cut, it's something really dramatic has happened and it goes completely off where you were supposed to go. They, they don't care. Yeah. You know, they just want they want that drama. Right. I think good. a lot of stars now too come in with the pre-planned drama in their head, and because they know that if they have more drama, they're going to have more appeal, and then they're going to keep using them. So I don't even know that you have to do that with some people and tell them because they're already you'll be my boyfriend, you'll do this, we're going to have this fight. Well, you know, too, and another thing that happens in reality TV quite a bit is is the the famous come to Jesus meeting where you take your talent and you say, <laughs> look, if you don't start showing up emotionally and mentally in scene. 
you're not going to be here for the next season because we've got three episodes left and you've got to, you know, I know that you have conflict with this person. You're not sharing it in scene. You're holding everything in. When they find out that they might not be back for a second season, it's amazing how the wheels start turning and all of a sudden people start becoming more vocal about their conflict and really expressing themselves. It's, <laughs> it's, terrible. it's terrible that it comes down to that in production, but it's one of those things where, you know, you have to, you have to coach. It's strange that you would have to coach your talent to be themselves. Right. But it's that thing where, you know, there are some people that are just like, well, I'm just worried how I'm going to come off. I just want to seem like a nice person. Well, nice people don't have reality TV shows. shows. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. I think, too, though, that's, that's, that's been a, a really big change um, to me is that people are savvy to reality TV now. And anybody that you cast, um, you know, especially we see it because we're the first persons to deal with them. They either have in their mind, speaking to your point, they either have in their mind the character they're going to be and they're completely committed to, to playing that character. Or once they get involved with it, they overthink it, they become somebody different, and then you're stuck going, okay, you can't overthink who you are and how you say things because that just never comes across um, good. It's, it's boring. I had an experience once, I won't say which show, but I had a, a, a gentleman who, um, you know, you try to coax when you're, when you're the producer and you're standing in front of somebody and you're trying to get them to say, get to something that you need for the story. And you're trying, and tried this way, and tried this way, and tried this way, and they just they just won't say it. And, and I tried with him 50 times to get him to say this one thing. And finally, he looked at me and he goes, "Just tell me what you want me to say. Just tell me." And I was like, "Fine, say this." He goes, "Great, I'll say it." And it was like, "Thank you. That just saved hours of our lives that we'll never get back." So. That's, uh, that happened. Except for in the edit bay, where they're like, how many times is she going to ask him to say this? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what advice would you give um, the folks who might have a great idea and you know, want to see, want to get, pitch their story ideas to somebody? Um, is there any avenue still for people to, you know, newbies starting out in the industry to really get their stories on the air? I think what Troy was saying earlier is um, the production companies are really your best bet. And, and I think you have to do your research. There are some production companies that do not take pitches, um, you know, not to, not to be a Debbie Downer, but it's extremely, extremely hard to get in the door to pitch when you have nothing um, under your belt. I think it's still, you know, uh, the same old find a production company, work for them. If development's what you want to do, that's still the best avenue to take is either do an internship, uh, is invaluable if you can get a good internship um, and get some experience under your belt, find a production company and whether you have to start as a PA or an assistant in the development department, it's invaluable. I can tell you I don't know I don't know anyone who had no experience, had a good idea, and um, sold that idea just off of falling into the right place. Um, it's still the same old work your way up and, and find somewhere that'll let you do that. Now, I, I do know someone that has, that has had that experience, and it was the most aggravating thing I've ever <laughs> overheard. It's like, oh, you sold a show. Congratulations, first timer. I've been here for 10, 10 years. Um, but I will also tell you that the one thing that you need to think about when you're, when you're putting a show together, even before you go to a production company, is how to add value uh, to yourself as someone who's involved with that. Um, when I pitch across the aisle in scripted, which doesn't happen very often, but I do have some scripted properties that I've been pushing over the course of the last year, I don't have, ex I don't have a lot of experience or credits in traditionally scripted television. But when I'm pushing that, I always say, I'm always, creating real, I'm always creating a scripted show that has an element of reality television in it. Well, it's about a reality television crew in South Florida and the crazy things that happen to them when they do this cop follow show, or they have this blah, blah, blah. And I have a personal connection to that. If you were, like say, if you, if you were an attorney for 10 years, you could, if you were creating a reality show that was about a group of unusual attorneys who take on bizarre pro bono cases, then you have some value added because you are very familiar with that universe and that, that when you come in, you can sell that with some kind of conviction. Uh, the third thing that you could do is if you have access to talent, if your brother-in-law is a quarterback for a football team, um, rare situation, um, but if that should happen and you want to build a show about him, then you have added value because you have talent that's already attached to the project. When you attach talent to the project, get that on paper. There's no such thing as a verbal commitment. You need to have that stuff on paper and have them locked down for 120 days or however long you're going to pitch. Um, but just figure out a way 
to make yourself valuable to what it is you're putting forward. And don't come up with ideas that are so broad and so general and so simple that you know that people have heard it a hundred times before. Really try to figure out if you're going to pitch something to a network. You can go on Wikipedia right now. I, like I was creating shows that I wanted to go to Food Network because I knew we had a connection. You can see a list of every show that's ever been on Food Network and go down the list and go, okay, my show's not like that, it's not like that, it's not like that. The worst thing you can do is walk in and pitch a show that they've already made and aired. So just do your research, you know, add your, add your value to your concept, um, and good luck.